Hello everybody, Professor Barth here, part B of lecture 14. I actually just finished recording what will turn out to be parts A and B. I thought it would be a single video, it was 30 minutes long, too long for a single video, so I'm splitting it right down the middle and creating a part B that meant I needed, and I needed a new intro, so here it is. Uh, if you haven't seen part A, check out part A, but let's continue back uh, with our discussion of the financial revolution and the chartering of the Bank of England, really important stuff. The need to finance this war, together with this alteration in the English Constitution, made possible the financial revolution in England. So the alteration in the English Constitution, which overthrew absolute monarchy, eliminated that objection to banking institutions, and then financed, and then, the, excuse me, the need to finance a quarter century long of warfare led to the chartering of the Bank of England in 1694. The Bank of England would not have been chartered under James II, at least in the form that it was chartered. And there is the, uh, the men, uh, initial founders of the Bank of England gathered around forming their, their constitution. The Bank of England, a private bank, but a, 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 a very powerful bank, a bank with a lot of capital. Again, the advantage of a bank, you can pool capital together. Parliament incorporated this bank. The bank, in return for that charter from the English government, agreed to extend to the English government a loan of 1.2 million pounds sterling. It's a lot of money. So a loan of 1.2 million pounds sterling and 8% interest. 8% interest, that's a pretty high interest rate. Now future loans that the Bank of England will make will be a bit lower, you know, usually around 5% interest, but this initial loan was 8% interest. That's a lot of money and that's a lot of interest you know, payments. You look at 8% of 1.2 million is 100,000 pounds sterling, just in interest and you would have to pay that every year. That's an annual interest payment of 100,000 pounds sterling. And so as security for that loan, as a, as a sort of collateral, Parliament passed, along with this, this Bank of England, charter of the Bank of England, simultaneously passed new taxes. The, the specific tax was a tax on shipping that was expected to bring in 140,000 pounds sterling in revenue every year. But with those new taxes, 100,000 pounds sterling was to be delivered immediately to the bank to, to pay this interest. That was a big deal. I mean, this is a big project. Nothing of this sort had ever been done in English history. This is the start, the beginning of the national debt the national debt and the national debt there's a desire for long-term loans loans that you know traditionally before 1688 the standard loan government bonds it, you know would last you know a, a year or two or a, a pretty short time but long-term debt debt that you don't have to pay off the principal in any you know immediate in any short-term sense you could just continue to pay recurring interest payments and not have to worry about paying off that principal long-term debt national debt and the bank of england in, in exchange in return received a lot of privileges those interest payments secured by taxes new taxes received a monopoly over banking in, in london so the parliament said no, uh, no other bank is allowed to operate in London. Banks ended up sprouting up outside of London, but inside of London, the capital city, only the Bank of England is allowed to function as an incorporated bank. The Bank of England was permitted to issue banknotes, and these banknotes would be redeemable on demand in specie and coin. And the Bank of England was permitted to keep fractional reserves. So a lot of privileges here. Here's a, a Bank of England note 
from the early 19th century. It was the earliest one I was able to find online. Now there were banks that began to sprout up outside of London and these were known as the country, country banks, country banks. And these were private banks, just like the Bank of England, but they were much smaller, smaller in scale, but they too issued banknotes. And so after, this is why it's called the financial revolution, you went from a, a situation without, without banknotes um, to uh, all of a sudden the Bank of England, these country banks are issuing banknotes country banks located outside of London. So that by the middle of the 18th century, there's dozens of these country banks each issuing their own banknotes, redeemable on demand and specie. There's some more country banknotes. So yeah, there's the national debt. <laughs> long-term debt government does not need to pay the principal in any short-term way only recurring interest payments and the bank of england was not the only institution to finance this long-term debt the east india company also did the same then you have short-term debt and short-term debt the government issued bonds the bond market and these bonds had a term of one year, maybe five years, or up to 10 years. And by the end of that period, when the bond matured, the government paid off the principal. And at first, actually, much of the national debt was short-term debt. But over time, long-term debt began to predominate. So 1688, there was zero national debt. Just, it didn't exist. The government borrowed some money, but then you know it was a short turnaround. There was no long-term debt to speak of. By the end of the first war with France, the national debt was 10 million pounds sterling. Or if you uh, want to translate that, 10 million pounds sterling was, I had it here, If I can find it, maybe I didn't write it down. Okay, I have uh, this last one. But 1714, by the end of the Second War of France, national debt was 36 million pounds sterling, which amounted to nearly 10 million ounces of gold. So from zero national debt to 1714, 36 million pounds sterling, or nearly 10 million ounces of gold, that's how much the parliament was in debt. So financial revolution, chartering of the Bank of England, national debt, the bond market, the bond market, buying and selling government debt. And of course, there's a very vibrant bond market in our economy today. And there will always be a vibrant bond market. It's a pretty a staple thing of, in uh, government finance. Securities markets. These began to really take off after the 1690s in England. And the security, it gets very, very complicated. Fortunately for you and for me, we're not gonna go into the details, but a security, securities are tradable financial assets, paper instruments, paper assets. And you have all sorts of different types of securities. You have debt securities, which include banknotes, government bonds, corporate bonds. You have equity securities, which include stocks, namely, and then you have derivatives. And derivatives, that's where it gets, can get really complicated. Futures, options, swaps, and all the rest. But all tradable, you could buy and sell them in markets, securities markets, and a lot of money to be made for shrewd and skillful traders. So that when you look at a fractional reserve banking sheet, Again, your demand liabilities, 15% reserves, 85% will be held in other assets, including loans and securities. And those securities can be all over the map, all over the map. The problem with this end of the, this part of the balance sheet, 
is that these the value of those securities when the bank puts them on their balance sheet the value of those securities can fluctuate and they can crash as we'll see in part b uh, so this could sometimes be a very unstable system it relies on stability and securities are not always stable securities are not always stable we'll see more of that later in this semester the stock exchange in london took off by 1695 exchange alley in the city of london you had 93 different english joint stock companies buying and selling shares or uh, selling shares and, and stock traders buying and selling shares so really really big developments now this financial revolution had a lot of support had a lot of support and there were strong arguments in favor of this financial revolution first of all credit was more widely available than at any other time in english history and if you look at the example of holland and sweden and germany the same was true in those places as well credit was easier there were lower interest rates as a result of these new banks and and um, new financial tools this the argument went encourages manufacturing entrepreneurship enterprise industry new businesses later when we talk about alexander hamilton hamilton is firmly in this camp in the school of thought more credit more industry credit will fuel the rise of industry and, and will finance much of this activity which will in turn grow a nation's prosperity of course this enhanced the ability to finance government and finance warfare and that was very true government was it was easier for government to borrow money and then the other argument was that the government in forming a bond with the what was called the moneyed interest in alliance with the banks in alliance with bankers and financiers in doing that the government actually strengthened itself because let's say for example in 1714 with all of this national debt let's say there was the threat of a revolution again in england and the current parliament and the current monarchy was going to be overthrown do you think the men and the financiers who had lent this government 36 million pounds sterling collectively all of them together do you think they would uh be okay with that revolution if uh, there was the chance that a new government would take its place and repudiate that old debt and say that's not my debt that was the old government's debt um unlikely and so by hamilton by the way makes this argument as well in supporting national debt it says look in forming an alliance with the banking community with financiers with the moneyed interest government will be stronger and will be less likely it will be less likely that um, something like uh, a, a revolution could take it down there was a lot of opposition to the financial revolution for part b we're going to take a look at why that was a lot of it had to do with bubbles bubbles there was a, a a sentiment that all of this new credit all this new these new financial paper instruments and all of it everything we just talked about was creating a a a phony system that there was a propensity for this system to to have you know boom the boom bust cycle the boom bust cycle uh that a system like this one you know the, the opponents of the financial revolution will look at some of these assets and look at them and and wonder does this represent anything real or is this just a bunch of stock jobbers as they sometimes call them 
or big bankers and financiers dealing back and forth in paper, completely fictitious, not representing any, any real wealth, but just financial shenanigans. And, and that this isn't real wealth that's being created here, but it's just a bunch of paper, paper debt and, and nothing real is involved here. Um, the only thing that's real involved here is that we've created a massive national debt, which then in turn creates all, you know, vast interest payments to these bankers. I mean, the fact that you had to pay as a British taxpayer, you're paying taxes and that money is going directly to private bankers. Is that really a free country? Is that really, you know, when my, my hard earned wealth and money is fine, is going to pay interest on this national debt and is profiting this small moneyed elite, this small moneyed elite. A lot of people looked at that and said, Mm -mm. No, 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 no. There's something really wrong with this system. It promotes speculation. We'll define that next time. Gambling. We'll look at some examples next time. Creates a financial elite that essentially has more power or at, at worst, more power or at best equivalent power to the state or to the government itself because of the power that it has over money and credit. And that we're, we're playing with fire by creating this, this elite. It creates corruption in government. Where members of parliament and people in government own stock in some of these banks. Or members of parliament deal in some of these securities and, and stock shares and insider trading and all the, all the rest. This is a problem. This is a really big problem opponents of the financial revolution say and so part b we're going to take a look at three examples of of bubbles that took place that quite alarming to a lot of people at how rapidly a particular asset could rise 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 and then you know fall within a matter of days could completely crumble like a house of cards so i'll see you uh for that last part of of lecture four. See you there.